What's up? Today, I'm going to be going over the cons of going into the civil structural engineering industry. I'm going to include survey data, my experiences in the industry, and ways to compensate for some of these reasons that aren't the best in the industry. And for you, if you're a student or someone that wants to transfer to the structural engineering industry, it's good to know the cons. For me, I knew all of these things going into the industry. I've had internships, so I was perfectly fine with all these and I set my expectations straight. So I wasn't blindsided and I knew I could live with these conditions and I could be okay with it. Throughout this video, I'm going to be referencing some data from the NCSEA SE3 committee. SE3 did awesome work. They actually did surveys in 2020 and 2018 where they surveyed over 5,000 structural engineers in the U.S. where they asked them things about recruitment and, and retention in the structural engineering industry and other things as well. I'm going to provide a link to their surveys in the links below, so definitely go check them out. And look, even though this is a cons video where we're going over some of the negatives of the industry, I'm still very positive uh, about my career choice. And even from the survey results, over 70% of the structural engineers surveyed are satisfied or very satisfied with their career choice. So it's not all doom and gloom. And if you go into the Reddit forums, the ones that you're probably going to hear your stories from are the, the vocal tiny minority. So let's jump into it. From the SE3 survey results, I'm actually going to be listing the top three reasons why structural engineers uh, consider leaving the industry. And for background, I am talking about the private consulting design industry that works most mainly on buildings. So reason number one is it's a stressful job. So why is it stressful? Well, one of the reasons is it's a deadline based industry. The developer or the owner has a deadline to get their building built and they impose those deadlines on the contractor, the architect and the engineers, the structural engineers. So everybody's working off deadlines. It's similar to school where you have homework deadlines. And when there is a deadline, if you procrastinate or you weren't working on it, it's going to get stressful. I think another big contributing factor is the way projects are managed internally within your team. And the stress has a trickle down effect on how the teams are managing. If the developers and their deadlines and their changes are being mismanaged, same thing with the architect, that's gonna stress out the architect. If the architectural firm isn't managing that properly and making changes, that trickles down to the structural engineering firm. And if your team isn't managing those deadlines uh, well, it's gonna cause more stress on you, the project engineer that's working on that project. So for me, I think that's where a lot of the stress comes from. It sort of becomes a stacking effect and that can lead to really bad projects or really good projects if everyone is managing their projects properly, then you can have a really efficient project that gets designed, that gets built, and it's something that the whole team can be proud of. And I've experienced both of those types of projects in my career. And when I was most stressed out, it's when I could see that those project schedules, those project deadlines weren't being properly managed or properly staffed. That's when I would be most stressed out. So how did I cope with this as a student looking for a career? And how did I cope with it when I actually got into the industry? Well, when I was a student, I really liked structural engineering and I liked the subject and I like to, to work on those projects. So for me, it was just a continuation of school and it wasn't that bad because it was project deadlines. So for me as a student, I didn't see too many differences. I think the only difference was that I was getting paid to work on these projects instead of school where you're paying to work on those projects. So I, that was actually a lot better, get paid. And when you're actually in the industry, what I learned is that I think a lot, a lot of it has to do with project management. So the people that you work with, the managers and the principals, and even the clients, the architects that you're working for, if they're a good team, it's gonna be a good project. But this isn't always achievable in some firms or some teams. And as you can see from the survey results, that's one of the top reasons that engineers uh, leave or consider leaving the industry. So what do you do if you're in that position and you're already working? and you don't wanna deal with the stress anymore. Well, what I've seen, if you still wanna stay in the design industry, probably wanna go look for a firm that has that culture uh, or that uh, that's well-organized and they try not to stress out their employees too much with, with that type of workload and those types of deadlines. Another route where you can still use your structural engineering skills is to go maybe into a, a government position. You might do plan checking or you can go to a, a third party type of firm where they do plan checks. I've heard those are a lot less stressful in general. Or try looking for other career paths that are in structural engineering that don't have those types of deadline environments in them as much anyways. And I actually made a video on that with different career paths and I'll link it here somewhere below if you wanna check that video out. 
the second con of the structural engineering industry is the work-life balance. So how bad is the work-life balance? Is it 80 hours, 60 hours, 40 hours? Well, according to the SE3 survey, 24% of the structural engineers work 35 to 40 hours, 44% worked 40 to 45 hours, 24% worked 45 to 50 hours, and the last 9% worked 50 plus hours. And also according to the SC3 survey, with regards to the satisfaction of work-life balance, about 56% were either satisfied or very satisfied, 23% were about neutral, and the last 22% were not satisfied. So there's a good chance that you could be working 40 hours, but it's not going to be uncommon for you to, to work more than that. And from my experience, this is pretty much true. It's the deadline. Uh, it's a deadline based industry. So you're going to have times where you're kind of chugging along 40 hours a week, but then a deadline comes, you got to put in more work. So maybe for the, for the next week or two, you're going to be putting in a little bit more hours to meet those deadlines. And for me, I think that's how it should be. That's how you retain employees. That's how I've been in the industry for so long is because I would have those ebbs and flows, the stressful periods, the not so stressful periods. And it has a lot to do with the company culture and what they expect from you. I know structural engineering firms where their employees almost strictly work 40 hours a week. It's rare for them to go over. You have firms where it's like my experience where it kind of ebbs and flows and you should strive to work in those types of companies. But there's also companies that I've heard of where, you know, their company culture isn't that great and you are expected to work uh, 60, 70, 80 hours. And that's the type of company culture. And if you, if that's that first type of company that you join in, you think that's the way the industry is. You're always required to work 60, 70 hour weeks. And as you can see from the survey results, that's not the norm. And for me personally, that's not sustainable. I think you're gonna have a lot of turnover if you have an experience like that uh, in any company. As a student, how I cope with it going into it is, you know, I talked to a lot of structural engineers that came from uh, different structural engineering firms. So I knew what type of company culture was bad, like that 80 hour uh, a week one. There are firms like that don't work for those types of firms, but there's also a lot of other firms that fall in between and that's what the norm should be. So how do you deal with this if you're a project engineer and you consistently have a lot of hours on you? One thing that you can do is basically ask for help. The, the managers, the principals, communicate with them. You're overloaded with work and you're overloaded on a consistent basis. That's not your fault. Your firm doesn't have enough resources to be on that project. So your managers, your principals, they should try to get you that help. If, you com if you're communicating with them, they should be trying their best to help you succeed. So you're not mentally burned out and you're set up to fail on that project. And again, if that doesn't work out for you, you could always try going to another firm or going into some of the other less stressful career paths that I'm gonna link that video again of, of where I mentioned other career paths. And the third con of the structural engineering industry is compensation, pay, or salary. And so how much do structural engineers make in the US? According to the SE3 survey that they conducted in 2018, the average salary for an entry level or staff is around 74K. Project engineers around 83K. Project managers are around 111K. And it just goes up from there if you're an associate or a shareholder or a principal in a firm. If you wanna look at pay by years, Five years into the industry, you can expect around 82K. Seven to 10 years is when you can expect to get paid that 100K mark, and it steadily goes up from there. Now, wait a minute, if you're a normie, a non-engineer, you're probably going, well, that's, that's pretty good money. You may not be paid as much as lawyers or doctors or investment bankers or even programmers, but that's a livable salary. You're not dirt poor. Based on my experience, I'm not even that frugal. I get Starbucks every day and I eat out a lot. I paid off my student loans. I have enough money to invest and buy property. So why is this a problem? Why is this one of the main reasons that engineers want to consider leaving the profession for? My opinions on this, I think the first one is the risk involved in the profession. There's a lot of liability that goes into, especially the engineering disciplines when they're doing civil engineering work, such as uh, buildings or civil engineering. Once they stamp those designs, if anything goes wrong with it, anything in the engineering that goes wrong with it in the next 10 plus years, 
the engineer that stamped that is still going to be responsible for that. They can still get sued. They can still get in trouble for it. So all that work and all the liability that goes into that project where you're basically gonna be responsible for it forever if anything goes wrong, I think that's not worth it for some engineers. And I do agree with that. We as an industry should be paid more, but it is our fault. It's kind of the way we're positioned in the industry where for most of us, we are uh, sub-consultants in a way. We are essentially farther away from the cash source. Uh, for example, the cash source would be uh, the property and the developers. That's where all the money is. Right below them are going to be the real estate agents, uh, the brokers that are selling that property and whatnot. They're right there. They're close to where the owners and the developers are, where the money is. So they learn how to position themselves correctly or in a better position. But below them are going to be the architects and the contractors. They're gonna get paid a good amount, but probably not as much as you know the real estate uh, uh, sellers for that property and whatnot. And below the architects and the contractors are the engineers and all the other consultants. And we're in that lower spot, usually working for the architect. So typically the lower you are, the farther away you are from uh, the cash source, you're gonna get paid less. One of the ways I've seen uh, firms and companies uh, not fall into that trap of just being the, the lowest paid is essentially marketing and positioning themselves uh, better in that hierarchy. They may develop relations directly with the owner. They have that one-on-one -on -one owner relationship where the owners might hire the structural engineers uh, directly. They're in front of the owners. They're working directly with the owners. They are directly adding value. The lower you are, the less the owners are going to see your work and they're gonna see you kind of in the background if you're that far away from them. Your value in that project is less perceived. And marketing and positioning too, if you're the type of firm that takes whatever you can get, the lowest bid, yeah, you're gonna get paid less. And if you're getting paid less, you're gonna pay your engineers less. But if you position yourself as more of a premium type of firm where you're gonna say no to a lot of jobs because they aren't quality projects, maybe those are clients that you don't wanna work with, and you basically have higher standards in terms of who you work with and the types of uh, project and the amount you get paid for. So I think those are the reasons why structural engineers are underpaid. I think the question for you is if you're a student trying to get into the industry is, is this enough money? And how do you get more money in the long run? Is this enough money for you? That's going to be a personal question that's, that you're gonna to have to ask yourself and it depends on your quality of lifestyle that you want to maintain. Can you live off $70,000 or $100,000 a year? And do you plan on having a family? And how does that all coalesce into your overall budget? But if you're in the structural engineering industry already, how do you get paid more? What's the fastest way? According to the SC3 survey, if you're in a firm, the fastest way to get paid more is essentially to become an associate or a shareholder or a principal in your firm. Other ways are switching jobs, switching companies, or if you want to go outside of the private consulting industry, there are more lucrative options out there that still use your structural engineering skills. I'll link that video in the description below. Thanks for watching. If you're in the structural engineering industry already, what are some of your thoughts on this? Do you agree with some of them or are they completely wrong or do you have others that you want to uh, contribute to. Let me know in the comments below and I will see you next time.